Thank you very much. We need to go get the bill passed. Thank you. Which way do we come? A snowy day in the nation's capital and federal offices are closed because of the storm. Here's a live shot of the U.S. Capitol building where the Senate is coming in. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. We'll lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, our souls thirst for you. Enable us to hear your songs in the night and be vivified by your Spirit. Lord, forgive us when we forget how your gracious hand has preserved our nation, multiplying, enriching, and sustaining it. Use our lawmakers to keep America strong, reminding them that eternal vigilance is the price for freedom. Thank you for drawing us into the multitude of your mercy, permitting us to experience abundant living as we make a commitment to not deviate from the path of integrity. We pray in your great name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. President, the Majority Leader. I move to proceed to calendar number 243. Clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 243 as 1356, a bill to amend the Workforce Investment Act of 1998 and so forth and for other purposes. Mr. President, following my remarks and those of Senator McConnell, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the nomination of Patricia Millett, the U.S. Circuit Judge for the D.C. Circuit, and immediately vote on confirmation of that nomination. Senators should expect additional votes this morning with respect to the reconsideration of the cloture vote on the non nomination of Mel Watt to be director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Ms. President, I ask unanimous consent that the statement that I was prepared to give be inserted in the record as if made. Without objection, is so ordered. Ms. President. The Republican leader. Tens of thousands gathered today in Soweto to pay their last respects to a man who symbolized so much for so many. And it's not hard to see why. Politicians come and go, presidents rise and fall, but Nelson Mandela was more than a politician, more than just a foreign leader. He was a symbol, a symbol of freedom and hope, not only for his own people, but for all people. But we also remember Nelson Mandela as a symbol of reconciliation, especially when he had every reason not to be. How many of us could spend so many years in confinement, away from people we love, with little to do but mull the circumstances of our incarceration and emerge so forgiving toward our captors? To me, it was telling to see that one of the many people paying respects to Nelson Mandela this week was an Afrikaner named Cresto Brand. The two men struck up an improbable but lasting friendship during Mandela's time on Robben Island. I say improbable because Brand was his jailer. The story goes that years after his release from prison, President Mandela was attending a ceremony and greeting members of parliament when he stopped Brand across 
when he spotted Brand out across the room. Mandela lifted his arms and announced to everyone that this man had been his warden, but he was also his friend. Then he asked Brand to join him in a group photo. You must stand next to me, he insisted. We belong together. I think that says it all. Nelson Mandela could have followed the example of other leaders in the region. He could have led South Africa down the path of Zimbabwe, but he didn't. He urged his country to embrace inclusion and freedom and democracy instead. He asked his countrymen to stand with him because he knew that, as he once said to Cresto Brand, his people belong together. So this morning, the Senate joins the world in mourning the loss of Nelson Mandela. May his commitment to freedom and reconciliation continue to inspire. Now, Mr. President, on to the business at hand. I want to start out by saying that I think it was important for all of us to get back home and hear from our constituents over the past couple of weeks. I talked with a lot of Kentuckians, and I can tell you there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of frustration out there. Folks are frustrated and upset by what's happening with their health care under Obamacare. And they're outraged at the tactics and the outright deception, deception, that led to its passage. It's now clear that the President knew perfectly well that a lot of folks wouldn't be able to keep the plans they had and liked despite the endless assurances to the contrary they heard from the President himself. Many are also starting to realize that the talking points they heard about their premiums and keeping their doctors weren't worth the paper they were written on either. And the response they've gotten from the White House in the face of all this is just as bad. In the face of all the hardship and disruption this law is causing for literally millions of Americans, the White House is defiant. In the face of all these things, the President is trying to convince people that somehow we are the problem. According to the President, the problem isn't the law. The problem is the people who are unhappy with it. The people who are unhappy with it, the President says, is the problem. Well, look, this is exactly the kind of thing folks are frustrated with, the idea that Washington knows best. So we're going to keep fighting this fight. If anybody needed any proof that big government liberalism doesn't work, they've gotten a clinic over the past two months. It's clearer now than ever that we need to replace this law with common sense, patient-centered reforms that will actually drive down costs and increase innovation. The idea that making our health care system more like the Department of Motor Vehicles will somehow improve the final product has now been thoroughly discredited. And a thousand presidential speeches aren't going to change that. But here's the larger story. Obamacare isn't an isolated case. It may be the most obvious example of this administration's determination to advance its agenda by any means possible, but it's one example of many. The latest example was the administration's complicity in the power grab we saw last month in the Senate. News reports suggest that the president who denounced this tactic when Republicans thought about it back in 2005 was actively lobbying for it ahead of the majority leader's fateful decision to pull the trigger. So the president and the majority leader were for the protection of minority rights in the Senate until they were no longer in the minority. At that point, minority rights, the rules of the Senate, and the principle of, of a meaningful check on the executive became an inconvenience, an inconvenience that stood in the way of their desire for more power. As I indicated last month, this was a pure power grab, plain and simple. If the majority party can't be expected to follow the rules, then there aren't any rules. So this was a grave mistake, and it was a grave betrayal of trust, since some of the main players had previously vowed they would never do it. And then they did. Just as the President had vowed that if you liked your health care, you could keep it, for the President and his enablers in Congress, the ends now clearly justify the means. And that's a very dangerous place for us to be. So Republicans will continue to speak out against these offenses, against our institutions, and against the American people, who have a right to expect elected leaders to keep their commitments and respect the rules and our laws. The American people have a right to that. American people have given us divided government. 
The administration needs to accept that fact. They need to work with the government that the people have given them, not the one they wish they had. They need to stop viewing the rules that govern the rest of us as mere suggestions to follow as they wish, while the American people are left to suffer the consequences. As I've indicated, we see the results of this mindset most powerfully with Obamacare, a law that this administration was determined to force through, determined to force through by hook or by crook, regardless of what half-truths it had to repeat to get there, regardless of which senators it had to coax and cajole. But the pattern didn't end with the law's passage. The administration has repeatedly, repeatedly invoked executive power to change whatever parts of the law prove inconvenient. Its friends begged for relief from the law, so they carved out special loopholes. Statutory deadlines became an irritation, so they waived them. Incorrect promises made to sell the law became an embarrassment, so they changed entire sections on the fly. To many Washington Democrats, this is all fine, not because they necessarily want to circumvent the law, perhaps, but because they feel justified in doing so if that's what it takes to enact their agenda. We've seen Democrats use the same approach with immigration policy, with welfare reform, with recess appointments. We've seen them use it to justify government-sanctioned harassment of entire groups of people over at the IRS. And two weeks ago, we saw Washington Democrats take this ends, justifies the means approach to a whole new level entirely by eliminating, eliminating the right of the minority party to be heard in the Senate, something they themselves had warned, warned against for years when they were in the minority, something the vice president called a naked power grab when he was in the Senate. Washington Democrats changed our democracy irrevocably, irrevocably. They did something they basically promised they would never do. And to what end? To what end? To pack the courts with judges they expect will rubber stamp the president's partisan agenda. To eliminate one of the last remaining obstacles standing between the president and the enactment of his agenda through executive fiat. In short, in short because they wanted power that the voters have denied them, at the ballot box, they try to get it another way. So before we all vote this morning, I just want to make sure we, everybody understands what this vote is all about. Two weeks ago, the president and his Democratic allies defied two centuries of tradition, their own prior statements, and in the case of some Democratic leaders, their own public commitments about following the rules of the Senate. They did this for one reason to advance an agenda the American people do not want. It's an agenda that runs straight through the D.C. Circuit, so now they're putting their people in place to quote one member of their leadership one way or another. This vote isn't about any one nominee. It's not about Patricia Millett. It's about an attitude on the left that says the ends justify the means. Whatever it takes, they'll do whatever it takes to get what they want. That's why we're here today, and that's why I'll be opposing this nomination. Washington Democrats, unfortunately, are focusing all of their energy on saying and doing anything, anything it takes to circumvent the representatives of the people. But ultimately, ultimately, they will be accountable to the American people, and the American people will have their say again very soon, sooner than many of our colleagues might hope. Previous, under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to resume consideration of the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination. Patricia Ann Millett of Virginia to be United States Circuit Judge for the District of Columbia Circuit. Under the previous order, the question occurs on the Millett nomination. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, 
Mr. Bozeman. Mrs. Boxer. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Donnelly. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Flake. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heinrich. Ms. Heitkamp. Mr. Heller. Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Enhoff. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johans. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Mr. Kane. Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch. Okay, I just didn't know what the order was. Mr. Robert. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott. Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, 
Miss Stavenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senator is voting in the affirmative. Beckage, Booker, Cantwell, Hirono, Nelson, Rockefeller, Sanders, Schatz, and Warner. Mr. McConnell voted in the negative. Mr. Cornyn, no. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Coburn, no. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Markey, aye. 
Mr. Pryor? Aye. Mr. Flake? No. Mr. Joe Hands? No. Mr. Merkley? Aye. Mr. Heinrich, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mrs. Fisher, no. Ms. Heitkamp, aye. Mr. Inhoff, no. Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Donnelly, aye. Mrs. Hagan, aye. Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Kane, aye. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Burr, no. Mr. Leahy, aye. Mrs. Boxer. Mrs. Boxer, aye. Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Roberts, no. Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Mr. Grassley, no. 
Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Heller. No. Mr. Johnson, South Dakota. Aye. Mr. Brown, aye. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Cardin, aye. Mr. Franken, Mr. Franken, aye. Mr. Tester, aye. Mr. Toomey, no. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Shelby, no. Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, no. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, no. Ms. Mikulski, Ms. Mikulski, aye. Mr. King, aye. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Durbin, aye. Ms. Ayotte, no. Mr. Coates, no. Mr. Barrasso, no. Mr. Portman, no. Mr. Sessions, no. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Corker, no. Mr. Wicker, no. Mr. Hatch, no. Mr. Udall of Colorado, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, no. Mr. Hoven, no. Mr. Rich, no. Mr. McCain, no. Mr. Bozeman, no. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Isaacson, no. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, aye.
Mr. Scott? No, Ms. Landrew. Ms. Landrew? Aye. Mr. Crapo? No. Mr. Harkin? Mr. Harkin? Aye. Mr. Alexander? No. Ms. Warren? Aye. She's looking at you. Mr. Levin? Mr. Levin? Yes. Aye. Mr. Thune? No. Mr. Chambliss? No. Mrs. Murray? Aye. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. McCaskill, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, 
Mr. Rubio? No. This is what? I'm sorry? Are there any senators wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, the ayes have it, 56 to 38. And the nomination is confirmed. Mr. President. Majority Leader. I move to proceed to reconsider it, consider the vote by which culture was not invoked on the Watt nomination. The question is on the motion. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Balkus. Mr. Baggett. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, 
Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Donnelly. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Flake. Mr. Franken. Mr. Chilibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Heitkamp, Mr. Heller, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven. Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Kane, Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley,
Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Rich. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. <laughs> Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott, Mr. Sessions. <laughs> Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Baldwin, Baucus, Begich, Blumenthal, Booker, Boxer, Brown, Cantwell, Cardin, Casey, Donnelly, Durbin, Franken, Gillibrand, Harkin, Heinrich, Hirono, Johnson of South Dakota, Kane, King, Klobuchar, Landrieu, Leahy, Levin, Manchin, Markey, Menendez, Merkley, 
Mikulski, Murphy, Reed of Rhode Island, Reed of Nevada, Rockefeller, Sanders, Schatz, Shaheen, Tester, Udall of Colorado, Udall of New Mexico, Warner, Warren, White House, Wyden. Senators voting in the negative. Alexander, Blunt, Bozeman, Burr, Chambliss, Coates, Coburn, Cochran, Collins, Corker, Cornyn, Crapo, Enzi, Flake, Graham, Grassley, Hatch, Heller, Isaacson, Johans, McCain, McConnell, Moran, Murkowski, Hall, Risch, Roberts, Rubio, Scott, Toomey, Vitter, Wicker. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, aye. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, no. Mrs. Hagen, Ms. Hagen, aye. Ms. Heitkamp, Ms. Heitkamp, aye. Ms. Landrew, Ms. Landrew, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, no. Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Ayotte, no. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inhofe, no. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, no. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, aye. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, aye. So, Mr. Barrasso, no. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby, no.